thank you everyone. I just I just want to give a huge shout out to Karsten and Manfred and the entire team. Um, this whole Azure Stack HCI days is, is just really brilliant. It really is fantastic. It's wonderful to get the community together. It's great to hear from everybody. And I was kind of watching some of the comments going through in the chat window and they were coming through fast and furious and we were you know, trying to keep up as fast as we can. Um, I know this is Azure Stack HCI days. I'm thrilled to be here to talk about server 2022. And look, I, I get that you know there are a lot of questions about, hey, you know what? Things are changing here and help me understand what's changing and we'll get through this change together and it'll all be good. Um, but I, I'm very excited quite honestly about what's new in Windows Server 2022 because we have been so focused on a bazillion things. We've all been very heads down working through the pandemic. We've all been working remotely. I know it's been a challenge to everybody and there are different companies and different organizations in different places in, in terms of, you know, you know, their their abilities from an organizational standpoint. Um, as Dave and a few others mentioned, you know, not everybody's on the latest version of Windows Server. Um, I've run into way too many people that are just getting to 2016 or just getting their first 2019s deployed. And it's just like, yeah, and what's the majority? Well, the majority of our stuff is still on 2012 R2. And so, you know, there there is a lot of innovation that's waiting to be, you know, just consumed in those those newer versions, but there's still a lot that we're doing in Windows Server 2022. And 2022 is, you know, let's let's be very clear here. You know, there's a lot of things that we are focused on, but these really are driven by your requirements. So, you know, Windows Server 2022, it's about running your business critical workloads and it's about running everywhere. It's about running in Azure, on premises, on premises, on premises, and I'm just gonna say it a few times, and at the edge. Because everybody seems to be, you know, un under the under the under the guise that, you know, we say hybrid, which means for some reason that we're ignoring on premises, and that's not the case. Um, our goal is to create the best of both worlds. We know that folks are moving stuff to Azure, and we know that a bunch of things are staying on premises, and that's great. That's fine. That's absolutely part of our strategy and has been since day one. Um, but it also means that on premises, we've got to, you know, make sure that we're doing the things that are, you know, that are important to you. Things like advanced multi-layer security, where we want to elevate the security posture of your environments on premise or, or wherever it's reside and doing that with the OS. Um, it's also with hybrid capabilities. We want to make sure that we can extend to the cloud for greater IT efficiency. We also want to make sure that you're getting the best of both worlds. If you have an on-premises file server, and, and there's probably a good reason you have it there. Maybe it's data sovereignty, maybe it's performance, maybe it's latency, but it also means we can make it better. We can give you bottomless storage. We can give you hot tiering. We can give you all sorts of capabilities that make that file server better because it's connected to Azure. Um, it's a flexible application platform. You know, Windows Server is used by millions of organizations and hundreds of millions of deployments of Windows Server out there to run apps. And yes, it's SQL, it's SharePoint, it's Exchange, but it's all the apps that our customers have written over the last couple of decades, and they love that flexible application platform, and they also expect it to modernize for new applications container-based applications, cloud-based applications. And so there's, you know, having a flexible application platform is, 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 is a key critical scenario of Windows Server. And then finally, of course, we want to help you evolve your organization with new uh, Azure innovation for Windows Server. So let's, we're going to cover each one of these. Let's get started with multi-layer security. So we've been hearing from customers all around the world. You know, ransomware keeps us up nights. We don't want to be next. We understand that concern. A recent IDC survey finds that more than one third of organizations worldwide have experienced a ransomware attack or breach. And it, it's more than that. Here's another recent article where dozens of hospitals and clinics are canceling surgeries and diverting ambulances because ransomware attacks have knocked out access to virtually all their operations. This kind of stuff honestly makes me sick. I mean, I can't believe that, you know, when hospitals can't service patients because literally they're they're held hostage by bad actors around the world. These security threats, they are constant, they are costly. Here's a couple of other examples from just a few months in 2020. In February 2020, over 142 million personal records from guests at a resort hotel were found on the dark web. 
In April 2020, 112,000 employees and patients from a medical uh, a hospital were compromised. In July of 2020, 450,000 residents of Polk County had their driver's license and social security numbers exposed in an attack. To put this in perspective, the average cost of a data breach is about $3.62 million, and we know that's just only rising, and it's really just scratching the surface. At Microsoft, we have a strategy. It's to protect, it's to defend, and it's to prevent. Protect with hardware root of trust, defend against firmware level attacks, and prevent access to unverified code. So let's start with firmware protection. 83% of all businesses have experienced a firmware attack in the past two years. And the goal of firmware attacks is really simple. Let's get in, let's attack the system before the OS is even started and implant malware. So let's take a look at one of these attacks and actually what it looks like in detail. So here's an anatomy of the Robinhood ransomware. Robinhood ransomware is distributed as a packaged executable that contains multiple binaries. One of these files is a gigabyte driver. It's gdrv.sys. This driver has a vulnerability that can allow elevation of privilege and this enables the bad guys to gain kernel privileges and then disable kernel mode signing to facilitate the loading of an unsigned driver. The unsigned malicious driver is then used to disable security products from the kernel. The Robinhood ransomware then goes on to encrypt files and demand ransom from the victims. Now, Robinhood is not an isolated threat, leveraging a vulnerable driver to achieve this elevation of privilege. In fact, the last two years, the Defender ATP research team has seen a rise in the use of vulnerable drivers by adversaries, ranging from commodity malware to nation state level attacks. Now, this may sound pretty awful, but the good news is we have a solution and we actually have proof of its effectiveness already. And that's with Secured Core PC, which we've been shipping now for some time. Secured Core PCs provide more than twice the protection against infection. That's why we're introducing Secured Core Server with Azure Stack HCI and Windows Server 2022. A Secured Core Server is a modern device that comes with the highest level of hardware, software, and identity protection ready right out of the box. So with Secured Core Server, it means it protects boot up with hardware root of trust. Secured Core Servers use industry standard hardware root of trust coupled with security capabilities built in today's modern CPUs. With Secured Core Server, it defends against firmware level attack. Secured Core Servers use hardware rooted security in the modern CPU to launch the system into a trusted state, preventing advanced malware from tampering with the system and attacking it at the firmware level. With Secured Core System, it also prevents access to unverified code. So once the CPU is brought up safely, the OS takes control. Hypervisor enforced code integrity ensures that all code in the OS kernel is trustworthy. And to help raise awareness, we're making Secure Core security obvious and visible with Windows Admin Center. And I'm so glad to hear that folks are using it. It's become a regular tool in your toolbox. And we're going to highlight these new security features and work together to make these Secure Core safeguards the new normal for servers. So we talked about firmware, we talked about compute and memory. Those are just a few aspects of security. Now let's switch gears and discuss network protection, starting with Transport Layer Security or TLS. Now TLS is a widely adopted security protocol. You're all using it designed to enable privacy and data security for communications over the internet. It's truly, it's, it's literally a fundamental building block of networking security. TLS is used to encrypt communication between web apps and servers like browsers loading a website. And it's also used to encrypt things like email, messaging, and VoIP. Windows Server 2020-22 uses the latest version, TLS 1.3. Now, TLS 1.3 has two big benefits. First, security. Many of the major vulnerabilities in TLS 1.2 had to do with older cryptographic algorithms that were still supported. TLS 1.3 drops support for these well-known and vulnerable algorithms, such as RSA key transport, which doesn't provide forward secrecy. CBC mode ciphers, which are vulnerable to Beast and Lucky 13 attacks. RC4 stream cipher, which is not secure for use in HTTPS. Arbitrary Diffie-Hellman groups, CVE 2016. 
as well as export ciphers that are vulnerable to freak and logjam attacks. So TLS 1.3 says, nope, sorry, we're not going to allow these. Next, TLS 1.3 is faster. The number of handshakes has been cut in half. And in cases where the client has connected to a website before, the handshake has zero round trips. This makes HTTPS faster and improves the overall user experience. So while we're covering network security, let's cover SMB encryption for your file shares. As I'm sure most everyone here knows SMB or server message block protocol, it's a network file sharing protocol that allows applications to read and write to files and to request services from server programs over the network. SMB encryption protects against man in the middle attacks. With Windows Server 2022, we've made SMB encryption more secure. 2022 introduces new AES 256 cryptographic suites and will automatically negotiate the more advanced cipher method. With Windows Server 2022, we've made SMB encryption flexible and easy to use. It can be configured per share or for the entire file server. And finally, SMB encryption can be enabled via group policy, PowerShell, or with one click in Windows Admin Center. Next, SMB encryption and SMB Direct. So SMB encryption now supports SMB Direct. So previously, enabling encryption disabled direct data placement, and this had a huge performance impact. Well, now <clears throat> data is encrypted before the placement, resulting in security and a massive performance boost. In addition to that performance boost, we also added AES-128 and 256 to raise the security bar as well which also takes me to our next sweet new SMB feature, SMB compression. I love this feature. Big shout out to the file server team. So SMB compression allows an administrator, user or application to request compression of files as they transfer over the network. Compressed files consume less network bandwidth and take less time to transfer at the cost of slightly increased CPU usage during transfers. You probably won't even notice it. A common scenario we're tacking, tackling is copying virtual machines. These files are pretty usually large and compressible. Let's show you a test we ran. So in this test, we copied a 20 gigabyte virtual hard disk from a Windows 11 client to a Windows Server 2022 file server. Without SMB compression, this took two minutes and 43 seconds or 163 seconds. With SMB compression, it took 28 seconds or almost six times faster and consumed significantly less network bandwidth. So your network folks will be pretty happy with that. And of course, it, to enable SMB compression, you can use group policy, PowerShell, or enable it with one checkbox in Windows Admin Center. SMB compression requires Windows 11 clients and Windows Server 2022 file servers. And by the way, of course, if you're one of those folks still on a really old fire server, 2003 era even, or anything you know after that, 2003 R2, 2008, 2008 R2, et cetera, and you need help migrating to Windows, your, your file server to 2022, let me tell you about the new storage migration service in 2022. So the storage migration service can help you modernize your file servers to Windows Server 2022 or migrate to Azure. If you need to keep your file servers on premises, Rock on, use Azure File Sync to centralize your organization's file shares in Azure files while keeping the flexibility, performance, and compatibility of an on-premises file server. So with Azure File Sync, this transforms your Windows file server into a hot cache of your Azure file share. This means the hot data your organization using is locally available. It's right there on the network. You're not going up to the cloud. It's super, super fast while the cold data is transparently tiered to the cloud. This means your on-prem file server is virtually bottomless. Well, with Windows Server 2022, the storage migration service can now migrate from NatApp FAS systems to Windows servers or Windows server clusters in the cloud or on-premises as well. So, <clears throat> I, I heard S2D mentioned many times, people talking about you know, how they love S2D and how they love the innovation there. And in fact, you know, honestly, I've heard feedback like that a lot. In fact, one of the things we've heard is this, 
S2D rocks. The performance, caching, and tiering are awesome. But you know, it would be great if you could use this in a single node environment for test dev. You know what? You're right. Boom, baby. That's why we're introducing Windows Server 2022 single node caching and tiering. What we're doing is bringing the storage bus layer technology that we've had from S2D to a single node. So with Windows Server 2022 single node caching and tiering, there are some huge benefits. Number one, it's great for your random IO workloads. And so the scenarios, SQL development, container development, or even a file server synced with Azure File Sync. So what we're doing here is we're taking the, the, the many benefits we learn from S2D in a clustered environment, and we're bringing these to a single node. For example, again, random IO workloads, because it's using SSDs for intelligent caching, it's great for SQL, for container, or even a file server if you're using Azure File Sync for a backup, um, as a backup uh, DR. Now, it is very important to understand this is a single node. This is one server. This is not a high availability solution. Let me repeat, this is a single node. This is not a high availability solution. In fact, I'd recommend a battery backup as well. If you need HA, use S2D and a failover cluster. However, for dev, for home labs, or uses with proper backups and DR, this can be an awesome solution. This requires Windows Server standard or data center and two drive types, like an SSD and a traditional hard drive or an NVMe and a traditional hard drive. So let's kind of explain this a little bit further. So this solution is a mix of both tiers and caching. The combination of tiering and caching improves random read performance as data is read from the parity tier and cached on the faster mirror tier. We recommend using a portion of the SSD as a mirror tier in a mirror accelerated parity configuration. This is for fast writes to the SSD. The other portion of the SSD is used as a read cache using our storage bus layer SBL technology. Now by default, 15% of the SSD is used for the cache. This way, both read and writes are hitting the SSDs. So let's talk about each one of these. We've got writes and reads and reads here. Let's talk about this, you know, this description a little bit more. Let's start with writes. When a write operation occurs, it lands on the mirror tier. Once the mirror tier fills up to 80%, we start rotating down to parity. That's why you see there's a little clock here. It's because we have to calculate the parity as we rotate and we destage to the parity, the hard disk tier. Now, there are two really huge benefits here. Number one, the write is occurring in SSD, and so it's really, really fast. Number two, when the data is destaged to the parity tier, it's done sequentially, which is optimal for hard drives. So, two really huge benefits. Next, we have reads. With read operations, the read is cached from the parity tier. So while the first read comes from the hard disk, subsequent reads are cached from the mirror tier, and again, much, much faster and not hitting the spinning disk. Now, you may be wondering, hmm, is there anything new here in 2022? Can't I do this in 2019? Yeah, absolutely, you cannot do this with 2019. There is a whole bunch of new things that are here architecturally and new logic that's in here that's specifically for 2022. What's key to this new scenario is that we've adopted critical portions of S2D to work in a standalone server, like the storage bus layer SBL and some others. Here's the another big difference. If you use standalone mirror accelerated parity without the SBL cache, for example, we don't rotate data from the parity tier back into the faster mirror tier. And without this performance would be, let me describe it as especially painful on random read performance, i.e. it would tank. And so a major reason, and, and, and this is a major reason why it required a whole bunch of new innovation, development, and new features that are delivered in 2022. Once the data is rotated out of mirror to parity, it stays there. And now with the SBL cache, we can cache data from the parity tier for faster, i.e. ridiculous read performance. Finally, one other thing, you may be wondering how many SSDs are required there in the mirror tier? So technically you could get by with one, 
but you don't get any resiliency with that. So we do not recommend that. Um, two SSDs are recommended at a minimum, so you get resiliency at the mirror tier. So um, one last note about single node caching and tiering. And this, I want to make sure I cover this because it, it, it may look a little odd as you're reading the documentation. Um, the server must have the failover cluster feature enabled. However, the server cannot be a member of a failover cluster. Now this may sound odd, but remember how I told you that we've adapted parts of storage spaces direct specifically for this scenario. Well, those components are part of the failover cluster feature. That's why it must be enabled. However, it cannot be part of a failover cluster. If you're looking for a tutorial, we have a complete PowerShell tutorial at docs.microsoft.com. Um, I'll drop a link um, in, the, in the chat window shortly. Uh, this is all delivered via PowerShell. Um, yes, we are looking into figuring and considering what an admin center uh, experience would be, but this is all delivered via PowerShell. Next, um, you know, we've been talking about TLS, I've been talking about SMP encryption, I've been talking about compression, I've been talking about security. I also want to point out that Windows Server 2022 takes full advantage of the latest CPU advancements. So with 2022, it takes advantage of the latest third generation AMD Epic processors, third generation Intel, Intel Xeon scalable processors. You get higher workload performance designed for flexibility at scale, new cryptographic acceleration, as well as advanced security capabilities. I also know that there are many diehard folks that are still running SQL Server on bare metal. I always run into them and hey, I get it. You, you guys are pushing the limits of compute and memory and just wanna let you know for folks, we have raised the bar again. Windows Server 2022 supports up to 48 terabytes of RAM, of memory, and up to 2,048 logical processors per physical host. That is not a typo. Uh, it's 48 terabytes of RAM and up to 2048 logical processors. This all came because Azure needed all of these things. And so guess what? We just made sure that we dropped this into Windows Server as well. Um, so we got you covered that. And while we're talking about CPUs, I also want to highlight the fact that Windows Server 2022 Hyper-V also adds nested Hyper-V virtualization support for AMD Epic and Ryzen processors. So if you want nested support with AMD Epic and Ryzen, the host must be Windows Server 2022 or Windows 11. The guest can be any supported guest. It doesn't matter what the guest is, uh, but the host has to be 2022 or Windows 11. And with nested Hyper-V, that means you can run Hyper-V and Hyper-V. This is great for test dev and labs. It also means, you know, nested Hyper-V not only means VMs, but if you want to run containers with Hyper-V isolation, we got you covered there as well. I also want to point out there's, you know, nested nested virtualization is definitely one of those interesting things. And I the probably the, the use case I've seen the most over the years has been for test dev and labs. I also want to remind people that when you do nesting, there are a couple of considerations. First, when Hyper-V is running inside of a virtual machine, just a reminder, hot add memory and dynamic memory do not work. You need to shut down the nested VM to change its memory size. This is by design. That's how it works. Um, we're not doing multiple levels of paging. That's, that's, that would, no, we're not doing that. Um, next, in order for network packets to be routed through two virtual switches, MAC address spoofing must be enabled on the first level of the virtual switch. So this is completed with the following PowerShell command, or of course you can just check the checkbox in Windows Admin Center to enable MAC address spoofing. We've got you covered. And of course, if you want to enable nested virtualization on your brand new AMD Epic or Ryzen, there is the checkbox right there in Windows Admin Center. Awesome. All right, so let's get to some cool new things in Windows Server 2022 networking. So 2022 includes some really nice networking performance improvements under the hood. And really a lot of this is brought over from Azure and a lot of this is starting, well, some of this is starting with UDP. So UDP is becoming a very popular protocol carrying more network traffic. Uh, UDP is being used for streaming, gaming protocols. Now there's the new quick protocol built on top of UDP. And this brings performance of UDP to a level on par with TCP which is kind of what's kind of hindered its adoption for a while. Well, with the rise of UDP, 
we realized it was important that we added UDP segmentation offload USO to Windows Server 2022. USO moves most of the work required to send UDP packets from the CPU to the network adapters hardware. And complementing this is UDP receive side coalescing or UDP RSC, which coalesces packets and reduces CPU usage for UDP processing. Uh, in addition, and I, I literally don't have the laundry list, um, but we've also made hundreds of improvements and optimizations to the UDD, UDP data bath for both transmit and receive. And like I said, I don't have a laundry list, but it's as we've been spending a ton of time looking at this code path, we've been tuning, we've been tweaking, we've been optimizing, and it's just a massive benefit you're going to get with both Windows Server 2022 and Windows 11. Now, that's UDP. On the TCP side, we've also been collaborating in the industry to optimize performance for high-speed networks. Specifically, Windows Server 2022 uses TCP high start to reduce packet loss during connection startup, especially in the high-speed networks, and RAC TLP or recent, recent acknowledgement tail loss probe to reduce recent retransmit timeouts. And these features are enabled in the transport stack by default they provide a smoother network data flow with better performance at high speed. And this is really important as you start to get to 10 gig, 25, 40, 50, um, where you know, retransmits can be expensive. We wanna go as fast as possible. Well, these new optimizations will actually smooth deliver better performance, better throughput at high speeds. And again, this is simply built into Windows Server 2022 and Windows 11. If you wanna know more, because quite honestly, each one of these has a, some beautiful papers uh, written on them, do a search for TCP High Start Plus Plus and Rack TLP. There's some fantastic documentation written by the standards bodies that explain these in full detail. Finally, um, on the Hyper-V side of the house for networking is the virtual switch. So virtual switches have been enhanced with updated receive segment coalescing RSC. And this allows the hypervisor to network to coalesce packets and processes as a larger segment. CPU cycles are reduced and segments will remain coalesced across the entire data path until processed by the ultimate application. Um, this, this improves, this change improves performance in both network traffic from an external host received by a virtual NIC, as well as from a virtual NIC to another virtual NIC on the same host. So in terms of performance across the board, I wish I could give you hey, here's a percentage advantage, but a lot of this is quite honestly, your mileage will, will, will vary. Um, what's the speed of the network you're on? What type of traffic are you using? Are you using UDP? Are you using TCP, et cetera? The important thing to understand is we've taken a lot of optimizations that we have learned and tuned and tweaked in Azure and in the cloud. We have delivered these in Windows Server 2022, and these help both on the host side as well as in the guest side. I also want to point out it's not a huge thing and I'm not going to spend a ton of time on it other than to say yes Windows Server 2022 does include the Edge browser in here. Um, I will tell you I would much prefer you to not use this or to ever even see a UI. I would much pr prefer you use Server Core and manage your servers remotely, but we do know that in some cases where someone has literally a single server, um, they need to have a local um, uh, browser experience and we want to make sure that we provide a secure one. So Windows Server 2022 does include the Edge browser. Um, also, it's a small thing, but I'm quite honestly pleasantly surprised by the number of people who have noticed that sconfig has been rewritten in PowerShell and a number of items that have been subtly updated um, within sconfig. And the goal of sconfig has always been clear. The goal here is to quickly enable a server to get on the network where it could be managed remotely with PowerShell, Admin Center, or whatever your management tool of choice is. So another, another enhancements there. So let's switch gears and start talking about application innovation. So as I mentioned earlier, Windows Server has been there since day one to run your apps, whether you've written your own applications, whether you're using Exchange, SQL, SharePoint, other third-party applications, COTS apps, whatever. We also know that the world is moving to different types of packaging and deployment of applications. We launched containers for Windows and Windows Server 2016. And since then, we have come a long way. Um, you know, as we were developing it, customers said, look, we need, we need innovation quickly. 
these containers are changing. You know, we've got Kubernetes, we've got Docker, we've got all of these different things out there. There's a lot of innovation going on around networking, around storage, and we need Windows Server to keep up with that. So we delivered a rapid set of container releases with 18 months of support. And this innovation occurred in the OS. We partnered with open source projects like Docker, Calico, Flannel, Kubernetes, and the result is quite honestly, we're in a very different place now. And now your feedback has changed. It's changed from, hey, we need a bunch of features to this. Hey, Microsoft, the container features and open source integration is great, but our org has what we need to run containers. Like our apps are deployed, they're running great. The problem is we don't want an 18 month support life cycle. We want this to be a longer lines of you know, LTSC. We want a, a, a longer, longer support life cycle. Well, done. That's why we're introducing five years of container support with Windows Server 2022. And I cannot tell you how many high fives and thank yous we have received already just for this alone. So in addition to that, with Windows Server 2022, we've added a whole bunch of new features like using group managed service accounts without domain join hosts, run globally scale applications with virtualized time zones, align with, with the industry standard container D, bringing the latest and greatest to Windows containers, enabling consistent network policy implementation across hybrid Kubernetes clusters, IPv6 support for Windows containers, multi subnet support for Kubernetes worker nodes. I mean, we, it's not like we we said, hey, we're going to give you five years of support and nothing else. No, no, we, we've still had our foot down on the gas pedal, delivering a ton of container innovation. And of course, one of the biggest things that everyone's always looking at is the container image optimization. Windows Server Core, the 2022 container size has been reduced by another gigabyte. And it still gives you all the compatibility you need, which is what our customers are looking for as they're modernizing their old applications, you know, their .NET, their Java, some of that stuff, and they're and they're bringing it on over to server core. Guess what? We've we've kept all the compatibility, but we've improved performance. We've improved compatibility. We've improved uh, uh, integration with uh, open source container innovation, and we continue to do more there. Then. We also have Windows Server 2022 Nano Server, which, you know, Nano Server is quietly just awesome. So, just as a reminder, Nano Server is a 64 bit only runtime. This was designed for containers, it's less than 100 megabytes. It's optimized and it's hardened for building new cloud apps. And it is quietly very popular. This screenshot came right off Docker Hub. If you look below the Windows logo, you may see there's over 100 million downloads of Nano Server. So Nano Server is this ultra light modern Windows offering for new app development. Then we have Server Core, which is best for your lift and shift Windows Server apps. And we've heard, unfortunately, we still have a gap. And this is something we kind of talked about a little bit in the roundtable, which is GPUs. GPUs are getting a lot more interesting. There's a lot more things that are going on with GPUs uh, around machine learning and AI. And many of you want to build apps that use GPUs for machine learning. Done. That's why we're introducing the Windows Server base image. So this image has nearly the full Windows API support. And it's built from Windows Server, not Windows Client. So we in the past had a Windows Client based image, but customers said, no, 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 we need server because we need things that only the server composition has, like support for greater than 10 IIS connections. And by doing so, what we are introducing is support for ML and GPU dependent applications via DirectX for Windows containers. So by enabling GPU acceleration for DirectX, we've also enabled GPU acceleration for the frameworks built on top of DirectX. One such framework is Windows ML. So Windows Machine Learning is a set of APIs providing fast and efficient AI inferencing capabilities. With GPU acceleration in Windows containers, developers now have access to a first class inferencing runtime that can be accelerated across a broad set of capable GPU acceleration hardware. So lots of really cool innovation here. And to make it easier, 
for people to do lift and shift, we've also got some great stuff going on with tooling for lift and shift. So many organizations have developers building containers for new apps. And you know what? You've told us that you want help modernizing your existing stuff. So Windows Admin Center has the container tool with an easy to use and friendly UI, and it just keeps getting better. In fact, the latest version will create Docker files for you. Admin Center supports um, containerizing ASP.NET and web deploy, and lets you easily deploy containerized applications to AKS on AKS HCI directly. Um, however, we wanna do more. We also know that in addition to Windows Admin Center, we tend to see that larger organizations are using the Azure migration tools and they have they have focused it, they're investing time and resources, and they're really comfortable with the Azure migration tools. So we've added the new Azure Migrate containerization app to containerize existing Windows Server apps as part of Azure Migrate. So we've got both flows. For the folks that are kind of more used to, you know, on-premises, Windows Admin Center, and smaller environments, we've got that. For those folks that are saying, no, no, we're in a large organization, we're in a large environment, we have our IT invested in the Azure Migrate tool set, great, we've got you covered both ways. So with the Containerize app, it targets the running server, it extracts the content to be containerized, it uses the Azure Container Registry, and creates a new container to deploy on AKS. The Containerize app supports ASP.NET IIS, and neither of these tools, neither of them, requires any code changes. All right, time to get to Windows Server 2022 Data Center Azure Edition. So it's time to discuss cloud innovation with Windows Server 2022 Data Center Azure Edition. So first of all, you may be looking at that name thinking, boy, that's a mouthful, Windows Server 2022 Data Center Azure Edition. Well, the reason why it's named that is because A, it includes all of the Data Center Edition features, all of them, and it ad adds additional Azure and Windows Server innovation, latest hybrid and compute features. This runs on Azure Cloud as well as Azure Stack HCI. Let me say this again, this runs on Azure Cloud and Azure Stack HCI. And it's the best Windows Server VM with auto manage. So what does Windows Server Data Center Azure Edition bring? Well, it starts with hot patching. Hot patching updates in-memory code of running processes. No process restart or reboot is required. And I wanna point out that today, as of right now, this currently requires server core. I'm just saying today, that's all I'm saying. Next, we have SMB over Quick. So SMB over Quick introduces an alternative to the TCP network transport. It provides secure, reliable connectivity to edge file servers over untrusted networks like the internet. What's great about this is SMB over Quick offers an SMP VPN for telecommuters, mobile device users, and high security organizations. Now, the server certificate creates a TLS 1.3 encrypted tunnel over UDP port 443 instead of TCP port 445. Now, SMB behaves normally within the quick tunnel, meaning from the user standpoint, this is completely transparent and the experience doesn't change. So if you're used to SMB features like multi-channel, signing, compression, continuous availability, directory leasing, yada, yada, they all just work as normal. SMB over Quick is great for edge devices, so they can safely access a file server. It's also great for telecommuters, mobile and hybrid workers with Windows 11. Finally, we also have Azure Extended Networking, which is designed to solve the challenge of moving apps to the cloud that need to maintain the same IP addresses. And this is really a challenge. So we've been spending a lot of time working to enable this scenario. Azure Extended Network enables you to stretch an on-premises subnet into Azure to let on-premises VMs keep their original on-premises private IP addresses when you're migrating to Azure. That's right, let me say that one more time. Azure Extended Network enables you to stretch an on-premises subnet into Azure to let your on-premises VMs keep their original on-premises private IP addresses when migrating to Azure. 
The network, the network is extended using a bi-directional VXLAN tunnel between two Windows Server 2022 VMs acting as virtual appliances. One is running on premises and the other running Windows Server 2022 Data Center Azure Edition in Azure with each also connected to the subnet that needs to be extended. Each subnet that you're going to extend requires a pair of appliances and you can do multiple subnets can be extended using multiple pairs. So Azure Extended Networking provides a path to IP independence and this is a really big deal. So let's go and do a quick demo. Uh, everybody loves hot patch. Nobody can get enough of hot patch. So let's do a quick demo of uh, hot patch with uh, Windows Server 22 Azure Auto Edition, uh, Azure Edition. Hot patching, so this is a new way to install updates. Doesn't require a reboot. It doesn't interrupt your workloads that are running on your servers. So let me kind of describe the demo environment. On the right, I have a new Windows Server 2022 Core VM created with Auto Manage, where I'm gonna manually install hot patch updates. On the left-hand side, for comparison, I have Windows Server 2022 Core VM, and I will install a comparable latest cumulative update, or LCU, and this is a traditional update. Um, you can see I've got a top, uh, I've queued up massive file copies here as sample workloads, and on top here, there's a timer, so we can track the status of the patching installation. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna start off the patch installation on each VM. First, I'm going to start the, I'm going to give a little head start, the traditional LCU on the left hand side, the latest cumulative update. Uh, next, the hot patch on the right. Oh, it's already done. Hope you didn't blink. Hope you didn't miss that. Uh, the hot patch is done. And by the way, you can see that the file copy continued at the bottom completely uninterrupted. Now, on the left hand side, you can see the traditional LCU is still going. It's about 11.5%. Uh, in case you missed the first hot patch, let's run a second hot patch, and we're installing the second one that's going to again happen on the right hand side. And you can see that, yep, and just like that, we've just installed a second hot patch with zero impact to the running workload. Now, one of the great advantages of hot patches is these are made in memory. So this means that even running processes pick up the new updates immediately and without interruption. Next, we install these updates manually for these demos so you can see just how impactful this technology is. In reality, I would use update orchestration. I'd be using auto manage to do all of this hot patching for you. So this is still going. So uh, I'm going to speed up the video here so we can get to the completion of this traditional update. And you can see on the left hand side that it's now done, but it requires a reboot to complete the update process. So if I reboot now, it's going to interrupt the workload, namely this file copy, and I'm going to have to wait for the file copy to complete. So let's speed ahead to the end so we can perform the reboot. And again, we did two hot patches on the right hand side in, I don't know, less than 20 seconds. And uh, this left one is just about done. Now we got to perform the reboot and there we go. So that was a quick demo of hot patching with Windows Server 22 Azure Edition um, with Azure Auto Manage, and you can see just you know delivering this awesome innovation, this Azure innovation to Windows Server. So, told you I had a lot of content. Um, again, the focus here is your requirements, advanced layer multi-layer security. We're elevating the security posture of the OS and protecting against the latest malware and ransomware. With hybrid capabilities, we're going to extend your data center for greater IT efficiency. For the application platform, we're doing so much with regards to AKS, AKS on HCI, containers, open source integration, and more. And we're empowering both developers and IT pros to deploy modern apps and modernize existing apps faster than ever. And finally, we're again enabling unique Azure innovation for Windows Server. But, and, and again, when I say Azure innovation, I want to point out that that includes Azure Stack HCI. So when you look at things and go, huh, you know, that Windows Server Data Center Azure Edition looks really cool. Well, keep in mind that runs on Azure Stack HCI as well. And that's another benefit of Azure Stack HCI is that we're able to deliver Azure innovation on premises. So with that, 
again, I just want to give a huge shout out and thank you to Karsten and everyone here at the Azure Stack HCI days. This is really awesome. It's really a pleasure to do that. And with that, I'm going to pass it back to you, Karsten. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. This was really great. I I, I thought I, kn I I knew a lot about Windows Server 22, but you had some impressive things there. I didn't know about the storage spaces things, and we have some questions about that. And uh, to be honest, a lot of questions in the Q and A. So I, if I don't get them all, it would be nice if you can go to the questions afterward and answer them, uh, some of them yourself. Uh, but let's uh, let's start with some. Maybe let's start with one that matches this topic, uh, the Azure edition we had at the end, because yeah, yeah. there is one in the chat directly um, with a question, will Windows Server 2022 uh, data center Azure edition have the same LTSC lifecycle Windows Server has, or will there be a new feature showing up earlier than it will show up in Windows Server? So it's regarding the lifecycle of this Azure edition. Ah, Azure. So Azure Edition, our goal is to be able to deliver this on a faster cadence because we're delivering things in the cloud. So if you desire the traditional LTSC, we've got traditional LTSC because everyone gets upset when we change things that we've been doing for the last 20 years. So we have traditional LTSC, but with Azure Edition, no, we, we want to also be able to deliver things on a faster cadence. Um, and again, because it's an because it's Azure Edition, think of it as part of the Azure service, we want to deliver it on an Azure cadence. So you can expect it, you'll see it on more of a yearly type cadence um, uh, with Azure Edition. Okay, great. Let's see, uh, are there any plans to use TPM2 on clients to identify and secure access to company servers like SMB3 over Quick? I don't know if you can answer that. It's very specific. That is a very specific question, and I don't want to give the wrong answer, so I'm going to pass on that one. Sorry. OK, um, I wouldn't know either. Uh, uh, as flagged in Windows Server 2022 Insider, uh, why PowerShell 5.1.NET 4.X and S Channel does not use TSL 1.2 as a minimum? S channel has similar configs as uh, 2019. Well, also very specific, I would say. Very specific. Yes. So there are there. Uh, you know, I, I I couldn't tell you why specifically that 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 is why it is in S channel. Um, uh, that I, I would again. I would need to. I would need to chat with one of my colleagues to to get the answer on that. I don't want to yeah. give you the wrong answer. Yeah. Um, and so you mentioned uh, the nested high, uh, virtualization. How does mm -hmm. VBS and Secure Works in a VM? Is nested Hyper-V needed? Um, so VBS and nested Hyper-V, because it's all on the hyper all on Hyper-V, we actually know exactly how to do all of that security work, and we know how to plumb it as efficiently as possible between the two layers. That's one of the benefits you have of using Hyper-V on top of Hyper-V, is this all just works, and it works extremely fast. Works extremely okay. efficiently. Cool. Then, uh, Jeff, having the document comparing the version as you shared for 2019 renewed with 2022 would be awesome. It's super helpful to help deciders and IT to see why it's not a good thing to start with 2016 or 2019 now. So yes. the, the, they ask they're, for they're, the documents if they are updated. Uh, no, it's very. I'm. I'm actually reviewing where it's in. It's in late drafts. Almost. I think we're almost in release candidate stage internally. We have just been working on a bajillion different things, but it is. It, it is well underway, and it's. It's in the final stages. And if you follow me on Twitter at WSV Guy, I promise you, as soon as the new version is posted, I will let everybody know. But yes, it is absolutely in process. Yeah. Then a question about the hard, the network improvement you you talked about. Do these UDP offloads need special hardware or just recent 2022 drivers? 
Well, no, the 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 NIC has to have the UDP offload support in the NIC. So we are we are basically querying the NIC. Does it have this offload support? If support, great. Then we will push it down into the NIC to do the processing and and hand, handle that off from the CPU. If it doesn't, then we of course handle it in the CPU like we always do. Yeah. Then I was very impressed about the single node caching. So here's a question about that. Does, does single node caching use storage spaces as base? What file system preferred, NTFS or latest ReFS? Uh, definitely latest ReFS. Um, you'll find, a, in fact, I, I should post a link in the doc. I'll do that in the chat window. I'll do that in just a second. REFS is definitely recommended because you want all the latest benefits of REFS. Um, um, in terms of, like I said earlier, um, so you know this this whole single node caching tiering that we're delivering in 2022, um, it is it is leveraging work that we have done in S2D. Um, again, this is innovation we've been doing in storage spaces direct for many years, but it is adopting it for the single node because there are there are very there's a different there's a different logic that applies, and it, we also require that our broad you know portions of the SBL cache on over, so we can provide you know high speed cache dating from 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 um, from the parity tier. Uh, for faster read performance, things that you you know normally wouldn't have, and if you tried to do this on 2019, like I said, a not work does not support will fail and performance will be terrible um, is because we had to really adopt and create you know and make this scenario work end to end but refs is definitely definitely the recommended file system i'm looking for the link right now to put in the chat window for the documentation here yeah and you mentioned in the presentation uh for the uh, storage spaces with caching i i i don't know the right word out of my head there is no vac so uh, so windows admin center integration so far but we uh, but the audience is hoping that something is coming right y yes so uh, you know it's funny that people mention that so uh, yeah yes so we are absolutely um we lit, we lit up powershell and powershell is you know how we light things up and then WAC generally uh will take advantage of the powershell because as everybody knows admin center uses powershell uh, under the covers um but right now this is all done uh, via 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 PowerShell. Yeah, so another question. We heard that Windows Server 2022 Essential Edition do not be root for the domain anymore. Is that true? Can we use Essential Edition as a RDS host or RDS license, licensed server? You can absolutely use Essentials as an RDS host. I believe it supports 25. I don't remember exactly the exact number. I think it's 25 users. Yes, uh, Manfred can elaborate on that. He's good in licensing. <laughs> yeah, yeah to, to add this, the new thing about Windows Server 2022 Essentials is that it's an OEM only product, so you will always buy it together with the hardware. And uh, we have the limitation Jeff mentioned, 25 users and uh, 50 devices based on the licensing from the technical perspective we have all the features in there we have in standard but the limitation one cpu socket, maximum 10 cores maximum 25 users maximum 50 devices um, we don't have any longer this uh, limitation that it has to be a root of the domain or um, has to keep the the fsmo roles yes yeah so I have another one and I'm curious about that too. I have my opinion, but I want to ha hear it from you. If you have Azure Stack HCI and thus licensing data center with, S with SR, does it qualify to install data center Azure edition or do customers need additional licensing for this running on the Azure Stack HCI? Manfred is doing this. No, uh, I'm, I'm uh, you want that this question because we had this several times. So yes. It's good that it showed up again. Sorry, so, say that. Give me the question one more time. So I think the question is basically if you have Azure Stack HCI and additionally data center for all the CPUs and maybe also uh, software assurance, can you then uh, take data data uh, data center Azure edition? So uh, Windows Server 2022 data center Azure Azure edition, put the VM on the Azure Stack HCI and it's licensed or do, do you have to additionally license it through Azure? Do you get the question? Or, or in other words, if I want to run Windows Server 2022 um, Data Center Azure Edition yes. on my Azure Stack HCI host, 
Do I yes. still need Windows Server Data Center for the host, not the Azure edition, but the Data Center edition to license my virtual machines? Or so can I have this Azure edition pays, paid by Azure, Azure consumption? So to be so to, to run Windows Server Data Center Azure Edition, you have to be running Azure Stack HCI in the host, and you have yes. to Windows Server has to be properly licensed for that server. If those two things are met, you should be covered. So you think it's included in the data Windows Data Center 2022 edition? If your host is Azure Stack HCI. Yeah, of course. So if, if I, your host if is I Azure Stack a, HCI. Yeah, I'm, on I'm, Azure Stack HCI. Yeah. Let's do this. Let me let me double and triple check this with the licensing guys, and and I will come back with an answer to you for that. Yeah, that would uh, be great because there's a lot of questions around this. Uh, if you have to license. Uh, Windows Server 22 Data Center Edition, uh, Data Center Azure Edition only through Azure, or is it if it's included in the data Windows Server 2022 Data Center Edition that you attach to the node? Yeah, yeah, or both. Yeah, yeah that uh, people are very interested uh, about the Azure Edition. Yes, when, on Azure Stack HCI. Intended functionality. I yeah. think it's especially the kernel soft reboot, and we had several of these questions in the direction of. What do I need uh, except Azure Stack HCI to be prepared for this uh, Azure uh, edition of Windows Server 2022 data center regarding the licensing perspective? Yeah, Got it. there's an, another one that's interesting. So Jeff, I hope you can uh, can give us maybe feedback uh, in the next six hours or, or five hours so we can publish it here. Otherwise, we have to get it to the attendees. Yes, some, so, some, so Carson, some here's what I'm going to do because I'm about to run out of time myself and I've got a meeting with, with my boss in three minutes. So number yeah. one, I put link to the storage spaces, uh, single node bush caching in, in the chat window. So everybody can get to that and take a look at that to better understand the requirements, the prerequisites and how it works. And it goes into even more detail with all of the PowerShell commands to enable it. And I would recommend Great. everybody sticks with the defaults. But one of the beautiful things about it is literally it's a standalone server that with two, I mean, literally you could put in two SSDs, two spinning disks, on a home lab and all of a sudden you've got a pretty rocking system at home to do some pretty awesome lab test dev environment. So that's something I would definitely take a look at. With regards to the licensing, I know exactly who to ask and I will go double check with this and then I will respond back to you uh, via the chat um, so that you have an answer because I want to make sure everybody's clear on the licensing of Windows Server uh, 2022 Data Center Azure Edition and apologies for any confusion about that up front and I will get you an answer and respond to that shortly. That's great. Jeff, great. do you still have a, a, a minute for one, just one quick answer or do you have go to for run it. now? I have, I have one minute, go. Yeah. Uh, um, Azure Stack HCI version 21H2. This is also 2022, right? So is it also or will allow for a single server solution? So people assume this or this, uh, this is it is assumed that Azure Stack HCI 21H2 is Windows Server 22. I think that's not, not the case. No. No. So will there no. be a single Azure Stack HCI 20? 2021 H2, 21 H2. Uh, can you can you do something with that? No, I, I don't think so, right? It's always a clustered solution so far. Right. What what we are doing is we are we will definitely listen to I'd like to better understand that feedback and what people are looking for in a single server solution. Um, but nothing nothing to announce today. Okay. okay, so thanks Jeff a lot for the last two hours. You were, uh, it was a great session and you were very helpful in the round table. So uh, I say goodbye to you and maybe we see each other at the next Azure Stack HCI days in Absolutely. 2022. Again, a huge thank you to everybody. Uh, really appreciate everything you're doing here, Carson. This is an awesome event and uh, really appreciate all of, all of the customers and partners involved.